like Gary says, uh, there's a difference between the servants of the church and the office of deacons, and that's what we're going to look at today. I've entitled the, title, the message this morning, The Servant of God. And as such, we need to get an understanding of what this word actually refers to. You know, there's a biblical word that we get deacon from. It's the word diakonos, and it just means servant. The full meaning of the word, in fact, is one who performs service for others. It's found in Scripture, and several places translated different ways. For example, it's sometimes translated minister. It's been translated servant, and it's translated deacon. Uh, in John chapter 2, for example, the servants who were at the wedding, who were the ones with the, serving the, uh, the guests, came to Jesus with the issue of running out of wine, and that's the ones he worked through for that first miracle there in John 2. Those servants were called diakonos, deacons. Uh, interesting example is in Romans chapter 1, or excuse me, Romans chapter 13, where Paul talks about this, those who minister justice, and we would kind of liken them today to our police force, those that minister justice, they're called ministers diakonos, which I don't really recommend the next time you're pulled over to suggest to them, well, I too am a deacon, uh, but uh, it, it is the word. It's the word that's used to talk about those that minister justice, and it's the word minister. Uh, in John 12, the Bible describes all who follow Christ are diakonos, and that includes... If you look in Colossians and Romans and Ephesians, you'll find men like Epaphras, Phoebe, who was a woman, and Tychicus being called diakonos, but that wasn't part of the office of the deacon. You can have women servants within the body of the, of the, of the church, but they're not a part of the, body, of the office of deacon. That is reserved for a totally different set. In fact, in Paul's writing in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, he addressed his letter to the, all the saints in Christ Jesus who were in Philippi, but then he signified two specific offices. Bishops, also referred to as overseers or pastors, sometimes called elders, and deacons. That these were two specific offices of the church. And part of what we're going to look at this morning in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul gives qualifications to this particular office. When the early church began forming its structure... These offices included a setting apart by the ordination. And that's what makes the office of deacon and other servants of the church distinctive. It's the ordination. That's the separation. And that's where so many get into, into trouble when they try to, to, to discuss about who should be a deacon and who should not be a deacon. What distinguishes a pastor from others who share the gospel is his ordination. Pastor shouldn't be the only one who wins people to Christ. There should be all kinds of people within the church. In fact, everybody, all of us are called to fulfill the Great Commission. But there's a role of pastor. And just as all of us should be engaged in service in some level, it's the office of deacon that's distinguished him from other servants of the church. It's the ordination. And that ordination is found for us in Acts chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, you want to be opening them to Acts chapter 6. We're going to look at that this morning. Uh, in fact, Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. It says, Now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. Now the Hellenists were the Greeks. Why? Because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Verse 2, Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It's not desirable we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, and here's the instruction given to the church, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation. And look at these three things. Good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and wisdom. Whom we may appoint over this, and your Bible probably says business. But verse 4 says, but we, speaking of the apostles, will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. You see, the disciples recognized it was a problem. And it did need to be addressed. And the church needed servants who could serve in a specific manner for a specific purpose. And not only within the church, but in ministry. 
This was a new development for the church here in in Acts 6. They had already begun to meet needs within the church through acts of fellowship and sharing. And we saw this earlier when you saw Barnabas selling his portion of land and bringing the money to the feet of the apostles. But now they were being challenged to reach not just within the church but outside the church with these widows of the Hellenists, of the Greeks. At the same time, the disciples recognized their priority was to prayer and ministry of the word. So what was needed were additional servants who could be involved in this need specifically laid out. So the office of deacon was established. Now, I mentioned about verse 3. Let's look at that again, uh, Acts 6, 3. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of... And we'll, we'll come back again and look at these three qualifications. Good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Whom we may appoint over this business... I got to confess to you, there's a lot of confusion about this on the parts of people. A lot of confusion in churches. In the way they think that the deacons are to handle the business of the church. You see, some confuse business here in Acts 6 3 with the leadership responsibilities of the congregation. I want to remind you the church has one head, and it's not the pastor. The church has one head, and it's not the deacons. The church has one head, and it is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church. And that both pastor and deacons are part of that body of which he serves as the head. So the pastor is called the overseer of the flock through prayer and ministry of the word. His preaching and teaching is to help give direction to the church. The deacons are called to minister to the needs of the congregation. It's the body of Christ. It's the church itself that governs itself. And that, by the way, is why you should be here for a business meeting. You should never think that, well, that's just for the decision makers of the church. No, there are no decision makers of the church. We are one body. And as one body, we must learn to come together to see what the Lord is doing with us and through us and among us so that we can go forth as His light, as His salt, in this community. The word business found in this verse is found in a couple other places in the book of Acts. I want to share these with you because I think it's important for you to see. In Acts 2.45, when it was talking about the, the church first coming into being, it says part of, part of the, the formation of the church was that they sold their possessions and goods, divided them among all as anyone had... You see that word need? It's the same word krya that's translated business in Acts 6.3. Also in Acts chapter 4, verse 35, when Barnabas sold his parcel of land and he brought the proceeds and laid them at the apostles' feet, they distributed to each as anyone had cryia, need. Same word that's translated business in Acts 6, 3. The term does not refer to the conducting of business in a decision-making process, but rather in the performance of ministry and meeting needs. The original seven deacons were to wait on tables, not determine who would be fed and how much. The deacon ministry is characterized by its servant heart, and that's why you've had the songs that you've had today. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The deacon ministry may include giving wise counsel, may help with direction and ministration on the church, but it is not the deciding board. We have a body of deacons, not a board of deacons. Some churches operate differently. Deacon ministry may take on many facets in the life of the church. By virtue of their ordination, they're set apart by the church from ministry to God. They may assume some worship re- leadership responsibilities in the absence of a pastor. And you had this happen whenever the pastor leaves. Or assist the pastor in such tasks as baptism as we did. And and we used four of our deacons that day when we had the baptism of Miss Patricia. They assisted in baptism and they assist every quarter at the Lord's Supper. Their primary function is to minister to the physical needs of the congregation, allowing the pastor to focus on the spiritual needs. Now, As the deacon serves, and I think this is what's really important, the ministry of the church is enlarged. Why? Well, the pastor is allowed 
to dedicate more time to the, his responsibilities as an overseer. The defined duties for each should be made clear by the church, and we have. That is, we have our, our protocols and our policies. Some churches assign every family in the congregation their own deacon to call on. We do. To use during times of crisis and need, you have a family deacon. You need to get to know them, and they need, they need to be in contact with you on a regular basis as much as possible. The role of the deacon must be understood in the terms of a service and ministry apart from the concept of administration. The qualifications of the deacon, and I think this is where a lot of people really want to get to, like the pastor, the office of deacon has certain qualifications that the church must consider in her selection of these servants. We go back to Acts 6.3, and I don't have this for the screen, but just to remind you, because uh, we've already shown it twice, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Acts 6.3 and the only other place where deacon qualifications are listed is in 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13. And we're going to look at both of them together. They overlap. Watch. In Acts 6, 3, it says that they are to be men of good reputation. Now, what that tells me is that their people ought to know them and they, they are men of integrity and people can trust them. Well, when you turn to 1 Timothy 3, 8, Paul told Timothy they need to be reverent and not double-tongued. You need to be able to trust what they say. They need to be men of integrity. They need to be reverent in the fact that they are men of dignity that inspires reverence in others. They need to be not double tongued. They need to be men whose word can be trusted. Integrity, honesty. Second qualification you find in, in Acts 6.3 is full of the Holy Spirit. And when you see full of the Holy Spirit, when you go to 1 Timothy 3, 8, you find two other qualities that Paul mentions in that same verse that he mentioned in the, uh, the first two. Full of the Holy Spirit means they're not given to munch wine and not greedy for money. That's 1 Timothy 3, 8. You should recognize that first one. What did Paul say in Ephesians 5, 18? Be not drunk with wine, but be what? Full of the Holy Spirit. In other words... The motivation and influence is not brought on by outward intoxication. It's brought on by the leadership of the Holy Spirit from within. They're not given to much wine. They, they rely on their influence to be from the leadership of the Holy Spirit. That's why they're not greedy for money. They're not being influenced not just by intoxication, but also by accumulation. They're not driven by the desire to obtain they're not covetous. So they're full of the Holy Spirit, not given to much wine, not greedy for money. Thirdly, they are to be full of wisdom. And to be full of wisdom, here is where it says they are holding the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. We're talking 1 Timothy 3, now verses 9 and 10. They hold the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. They have a wisdom of the things of God. Why? Because they've learned them from their pastor. You remember what Paul then will later tell and. Timothy, in his next letter, that which you've seen and heard from me, you need to commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. They're men of wisdom, holding the mystery of faith. They know what it means to be men and women of faith. And they've had time to learn because they have been first proved. What this means is that they should not be immature in their Christian walk, not immature in their Christian faith. You see, deacon nomination is not a popularity contest. It is the church seeking the mind of Christ so that we can find the man of God that he has for this particular time at this particular place. And these guidelines, these qualifications are guidelines that help us in this, uh, in this selection and in addition to these qualifications that are found both in Acts and in 1 Timothy, Paul amplifies his in 1 Timothy chapter 3 to include the family and the family life of the man himself. If you look in 1 Timothy 3, 11 and 12, what you find is likewise their wives must be reverent, not slanderers or gossipers, not temperate, faithful in all things. 
And then that line that is often used is just the litmus test of what it means. How, do you qualify for a deacon? Well, it depends. Has you been married before or not? That seems to be the major test. Folks, that shouldn't be the major test. The major test is all of these things. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. You know what this tells me, these two verses? That in the list of qualifications, he includes the family of the deacon, that the wives should be examples of their godly influence, of the man's godly influence over the family by reflecting the same values and qualities expected of him. And second, that their marriage faithfulness should reveal their stability and their level of commitment. And also, their children should demonstrate the father's ability to both discipline and provide. This is a tall order, folks. In fact, it may be taller than any church can fulfill. And that being the case, that's why you pray. And you say, God, show me your man. Because in addition to qualifications, there are qualities to be found in a deacon. Doing the business of the church requires certain qualities, not just qualifications. And the book of Acts only gives us two examples. You go to Acts 6 and you find Stephen. And Stephen and the whole story is from Acts 6 all the way, uh, verse 8, all the way through chapter 8. For, for, three, for three chapters you read about Stephen. What do you read about him? Well, the one thing that I want you to make note of is that in verse 8 it says he was, had a distinguished presence among the people. We've already seen this. He needs to be among the people. But notice also if you read through chapter 7, and I won't ask you to read it and I'm not going to put it up on the screen, but chapter 7 tells of Stephen relating the story of the Old Testament to his accusers with such a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He's even quoting what we know to be some Old Testament scripture. He had the ability to tell God's story. He knows the word of God pretty well. What's a quality of a good quality of a deacon? He knows the word of God pretty well. But most of all, Stephen had a courage in the face of opposition. He was able to stand for the truth even while they had stones in their hands. He was not afraid of confrontation and he was, had the ability of, even as we read the story, of being, it didn't result in peace with him, but he, he died in peace. Because a good deacon knows how to be a peacemaker, not just a peacekeeper. And as a peacemaker, he takes the situation, confronts the uh, not afraid of confrontation, and has the ability to bring peace out of the situation. There's another thing in chapter 7. Towards the end of the chapter, he had a conviction that was worth living and worth dying for. And as one fellow preached this passage, he says Stephen was just a stone's throw from heaven. <laughs> and he was because he was not afraid to die. Not for his Lord Jesus. And there's one more thing I read into this story that perhaps isn't in the text itself, but I can see it. He knew he was going to die. <laughs> he was not afraid. He was willing for the work to go on without him. Sometimes we're taken out of the picture, but we need to come to the understanding that the work is not about us. It's about him. That's Stephen. Let's look at Philip. You'll find him picking up in chapter 8, verses 4 through 40. It's a simple story. After the persecution and the, and the, and the death of Stephen, uh, folks left Jerusalem. Philip left, went to Samaria, started a preaching campaign, and, and, and Samaritans were coming to Jesus. He was fill, fill, fulfilling the second stage of the Great Commission, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. And that's where Philip went. You know why? Because one of the qualities of a deacon is that he has a heart for the lost, wherever they are. He'll go where others haven't gone before because he has such a heart for the lost. He has both that heart, that desire, but he also has the ability to share the gospel. He knows how to tell people about Jesus. 
That's what we read about with Philip and this, this Ethiopian eunuch, this treasurer from Ethiopia who was passing through. And Peter, or Philip heard God say, get up and go. So he got up and went. He joined with him in his chariot. He heard him re- reading from the scroll of Isaiah. He says, do you understand? And I want you to make, be aware of this. The eunuch's response was, how can I if nobody teaches me? Do you know why he said that? You're going to find out in just a moment. That is significant. So Philip got up in the chariot and he started from where he was in the scriptures and he preached to him Jesus. Because he was obedient from hearing God. His obedience from hearing God resulted from his time, spending time talking to God. You know, you don't, you don't hear from God very easily if you're not talking to him to begin with. His prayer life was good. God had a two-way communication. He was obedient, told to get up and go. He got up and went. And then in this particular story with this treasurer, this Ethiopian eunuch, he became a bridge, not a gatekeeper. When they came to the point where the eunuch was now in a position where he wanted to receive Christ, they came up on a body of water, and the eunuch says to him, Look, here's water. And it's the candidate who asks the evangelist, What hinders me from being baptized? Isn't that an interesting question? Do you know why he asked that question? Not because he was Ethiopian, not because he was a treasurer, but because he was a eunuch. Because, and, and I don't have time to take you here, but just if you want to make a note, Deuteronomy 23.1 in the law tells us that eunuchs were not allowed in the congregation of the righteous. He went to Jerusalem to worship God and they wouldn't let him in. So he's having to study the scrolls on his own. And when Philip joins him, he says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I? They wouldn't let me in. And he comes and he hears about Jesus and he gives his life to Jesus and he sees a body of water and he says, look, here's water. And if you read between the lines with me, what you'll hear him say is, I know what keeps me from becoming a Jew and I can't change that. What forbids me? What hinders me from becoming a Christian? And instead of being a gatekeeper, Philip was a bridge. And he says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he did. You see, when deacon ministry functions well, there's a reward. Not just for those who he helps, but to him personally. And to the church as a whole. Paul will will say there in that 1 Timothy chapter 3, we've we've looked at all the way up through verse 11, we've looked at at some important... uh, uh, qualifications but look at this one at verse 13 those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus that's why you should be wanting to become a deacon if God has put it on your heart when you go back to Acts 6 where the deacons were put into place originally You find this in verse 7. When they began to serve, the word of God spread, verse 7, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. There's that word again, multiplied. And not only the disciples. Look at it. Many of the priests were obedient to the faith. That's how powerful their presence was. So the deacon should be trusted by the people, controlled by the Lord, and able to serve in the wisdom of God. That's the qualifications from Acts 6.3. Trusted by the people, controlled by the Lord, and able to serve in the wisdom of God. And the deacon's family should be his best credentials. I want to close. The business role of the first century church has not changed. It's about ministry. It's about evangelism. It's about missions. And the deacons were called because they were fit for the task, not qualified to define the task. Their role was about ministry, not administration. They were to be the first and foremost full of the Holy Spirit. Stephen and Philip are the only examples that we have in Scripture for what first century deacons filled with that kind of energy were like. And here's what they were. They were men who were among the people, not above them. 
men who knew the scriptures well, men who knew the gospel and how to share it, men who prayed and heard from God. They were men who practiced obedience at the prompting of the Holy Spirit. They were men who desired to see others come to Jesus and involve themselves personally in the task. And they were men who would give their life rather than compromise God's kingdom. Would you pray with me?